The Pittsburgh Penguins made some big additions in the offseason, but the results have been up and down. Hunter Hodes is here to talk about where the Penguins stand at the holiday break. We've got all that and more on today's Locked On NHL podcast. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome, everybody, to the Monday edition of the Locked On NHL Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank everyone who makes Locked On NHL your first listen every day. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you can get new episodes as soon as they drop. Also wanted to wish everyone uh, out there a very Merry Christmas to those who are celebrating. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the show the host of Locked On Penguins, Hunter Hodes. And Hunter, it's been really up and down for the Penguins. You know, one game they look great, then they lose seven to nothing uh, to the Toronto Maple Leafs or lose in overtime to the Ottawa Senators. What's going on in Pittsburgh? Why so inconsistent? It's really maddening. You know, you can look really well. For example, they just beat the Carolina Hurricanes. It was the first time they'd beaten them in their previous five tries. And you can have the blueprint where you're playing really well defensively. You get some goal scoring in the goaltending. But then all of that goes out the window against Ottawa. They sleepwalk through the first two periods. And let's face it, Gil, they stole a point against Senators. They put up 23 shots in the third period against them. They were down by two goals. They get an early one in the third. They tie it with two about 2.30 remaining from Crystal Tang. It's like, okay, you stole a point, but where was this kind of effort in the first two periods? That's just the biggest thing. I don't think the Penguins are playing full 60-minute games right now, and it's really costing them. And I also feel like they're going away from the blueprint. They don't have what it takes, I feel like, at this point to be a running gun team like you saw in 2016-2017. When they've had their most success the year this year, excuse me, they've been playing being more stingy defensively. They've been limiting the high danger chances. They've been playing, I guess, more boring, if you want to call it in quotation marks. And they're still getting the offense, but they're also shutting teams down when they play like that. And for whatever reason, they go away from that far too often, even though you've seen the success of it with it. Excuse me. So I don't know why they've gone away from that. You have that what's going on. The power play has been awful. That's, I think, what really sunk them, a big reason why it sunk them in the early portions of the season. They had that 0-for-37 stretch. There's no excuse to be 0-for-37 in a season when you have surefire Hall of Famers on your top power play unit. That's just not acceptable, in my opinion. But when you combine all that with depth scoring that hasn't been there, I feel like that much. Ryan Graves has been a disappointment. You kind of just have what you have right now, and that's a middling team, despite the season that Sidney Crosby's having, which has been absolutely tremendous. Talk to me a little more about the power play. I mean, you have Latang, you have Carlson. Those are two great power play quarterbacks, two guys who pick up a lot of points, and yet the power play isn't gelling. W- what is the cause? You got all these Hall of Famers, you got, you know, future Hall of Famers, so much offensive talent. Why 28th in the league? I could probably spend an hour talking about this with you, to, to be honest, Gail. There, there's just so many problems with it that's been there throughout the year. First is just gaining the zone. So many times during that game against Ottawa on Saturday night, they just couldn't gain the zone when they, when the, the centers clear the puck. And they're able to get close to the blue line, and the center's like, okay, we'll just take the puck from you, and we'll clear it down. They're also dumping the puck into areas of the zone where they don't have enough puck support, and it's easy pickings for the penalty killers. You, when you combine all that, plus when you have a lot of perimeter play on your power play, you're not going to get anywhere. The Penguins have not had a shoot first mentality on this unit all year, except for honestly a week span, which was about a week and a half ago where the Penguins went six for 16 combined after they were 0 for 37. That was a good stretch. If they had been playing like that for the most of the season, they'd probably be in a playoffs right now, right now, considering how good the power play or considering how good the, the, players are on this unit but they just haven't gelled like a lot of us thought they would and because of that you see all these struggles again when you have perimeter play the no good zone entries they do this stupid drop pass to go backwards to go forwards which makes absolutely no sense i don't know why they continue to do that and when you continue to overpass in the zone 
you're just not getting anywhere. And they still, I think, lack that true net front presence ever since Patrick Hornquist was traded to Florida. They haven't really replaced him. But no one has had that shoot-first mentality. The movement has a, has not been crisp. And it's been a real struggle to watch this unit. They had six power play opportunities heading into the third period of that game against Ottawa. They only had three shots. And that's on the NHL's worst penalty kill in the league. That's not acceptable. And it's been killing the Penguins all year long. They have had numerous games, Gil, where the power play could have won them the game. And it hasn't just because that unit has not been up to par. And again, that's one of the biggest reasons why this team is where it is in the standings right now. If they would have had a few games where they had gotten just one or maybe even two power play goals, they'd probably have four or five more points in the standings right now. And they'd probably be in a playoff spot. So how much of that is coaching? Because we know the talent is there. Is there a problem with the way they're coaching the power play and just the general performance of the team? And is the coach a little bit on the hot seat right now? I think it's both. Both Pat and I on Locked on Penguins have called for Tar Reardon to be relieved of his duties as one of the Penguins assistant coaches and the guy who runs the power play. His system just hasn't worked for as long as he's come back to the Penguins. You can't be 28th in the league in power play percentage with Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, Jake Gensel, Eric Carlson, Chris Letang. You can go down the list for other names as well. That's that's not acceptable. But on the other hand, I don't think Todd Reardon is going out there and telling his players, oh yeah, just play along the perimeter, overpass, don't shoot. I think the Penguins always just want to look for that perfect play. They, I kind of, I've been saying this for a while. They always want to try to Harlem Globetrotter the puck in and then look for that perfect play to get onto Sports Center the next day when sometimes less is more. And I get it. These are Hall of Fame players. They are some of the best in the league. But some when your unit is struggling, you don't want to look for that extra play. Fire pucks to the net, get Bonnie's in front, and you'll be getting and the goals will come. But the Penguins just haven't done that a lot this season. So it, it, there's definitely plenty of blame for both. But honestly, right now, <sighs> It, it's tough. You know, I would maybe go 60 40 in favor of the players, but you can make an argument for Tar Reardon the same way for 60 40 him. All in all, the unit is an absolute mess. And I think at some point, I mean, it should have happened right now. Reardon probably should be relieved of his duties, but th this just can't continue anymore if, if this team wants to get back into the race. You mentioned Jake Gensel playing very, very well. Talk to me about what's made him so successful this year. He's been fantastic ever since coming back from the offseason surgery that he had. He's such a smart hockey player. And I know people out there try to think that he's a product of Sidney Crosby. That's just the most ludicrous take I've ever heard. He had, plays great with any center in, in the NHL. He, just his hockey IQ is off the charts. He knows exactly where to be in the offensive zone. And you give him the slightest amount of time He'll make you pay. I will continue to die on the hill that he's one of the five to six best pure goal scorers in the league, and he's going to be paid as such after the season. And I will say this, if this season continues to go down the drain or be up and down for the Penguins, Gil, I do think the Penguins are going to have to have a serious conversation about potentially trading Jake Gensel at the trade deadline to see if they can get a pretty big package for him. And I do think they could. Gensel, again, is one of the best goal scorers in the league. I'm not going to take pennies for him. They could try to re-sign him in the offseason if he doesn't sign with a team that acquires him. But that's just the way that this might be going right now. But any team that would get him would, I mean, that's an instant top line winger, at least second line winger, the top line winger for sure. But he really is a tremendous hockey player. You can put him on any line top power play unit, he will do the job for you. And also just his passing work is super underrated as well. Goaltending was a big question coming into this season, and yet, statistically at least, it looks pretty good. Talk to me about the state of the Penguins' goaltending. Yeah, if you would have told me that the Penguins, going into that game on Saturday, that they would have had two of the top 15 goaltenders and goals saved above expected this season, I would have laughed at you to be honest, because you all know the question about Tristan Jari. Alex Ndelkovich hadn't played well at his previous stop in Detroit, but both goalies this season have been great. Now, Delkovich, he didn't play that well against Ottawa, but I'm not really going to blame him too much for that. I thought the Penguins just really slept, walked the first two periods of that game, but he has been everything and more for the Penguins as a backup this season. Tristan Jari, he's also been awesome. And he's also been healthy. That's been one of the biggest things for Jari is his ability to 
not stay healthy when the Penguins need him. But with Nedeljkovic playing like this, it gives Jari the rest that he really hasn't had the last couple of seasons just because with Casey DeSmith in when he was the backup, Jari was having to play a lot of nights and that just opened him up to more injuries. Now with Nedeljkovic really playing well, you can rest Jari a little bit, manage his workload a little bit more too. But I really like how aggressive Jari has been this season. He's been playing really well coming out further to challenge shooters. And also for Nedeljkovic, he's not the biggest goalie, but he still uses his athletic ability to his advantage. And he's been able to make a lot of timely saves for the Penguins this season. It's really unfortunate that the Penguins are getting this level of goaltending and they are where they are in the standings because just a couple weeks ago, this team had the second best all situation save percentage in the NHL. And it's still up there right now. It's top 10 in the league, but you can't waste that kind of season from two goaltenders who you had questions about heading into the season. It, you, you just can't. And it's definitely been a big strength for this team. And I expect them to continue playing like this after the holiday break. All right, Hunter, why don't you tell our viewers and our listeners where they could find the podcast and where they could find you on social media? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. The show's Twitter is at L.O. underscore Penguins. You can follow my co-host, Patrick Damp, at Send and Fouette. And you can follow the Locked on Penguins podcast wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon Music, Sirius XM, all that good stuff. Well, the recap of the game against Ottawa on Tuesday before the showdown against your Islanders this upcoming week as well. All right, Hunter, thanks so much. Always a pleasure. Yes, appreciate it, Gil.